counting down. <laughs> right. Good evening, UK Crime Book Club. I am joined by Janet and Teddy. This is Teddy, so we know who's who. <laughs> <laughs> Teddy's so, not the author. <laughs> <laughs> we'll go to your books, uh, your book covers in a couple of minutes. Let's let everyone get a good look at Teddy. Yeah, have a good look well. at Teddy. Teddy, have a look over here. Come on, show them. You're saying that's that's oops, that's my best profile. <laughs> Say goodbye. Say goodnight. He get, he's going to bed now. Bye bye, Teddy. Say goodbye, Teddy. There you go. We're going to talk about books. Go on. Bye night, darling. Go on. Down you go. Oh. Good night. Good night. He'll go for a, for a, for his little um wee wee walk, and then he'll be in bed. Two biscuits, and he'll be. He's a happy boy. <laughs> Wish we were all like that. <laughs> no, that is so easy. If I went to bed just with two biscuits, I'd be all right. <laughs> Only two glasses of wine. <laughs> <laughs> Shall we introduce you properly? Oh, so yes, you are oh, Janet yeah. Pywell. <laughs> yes. yes. Show off your book covers. Show off my book covers. Yeah. Okay. This this is my um, Mickey Dos Santos um, thriller series. Okay, you can see them all there. Mm -hmm. um, there are um, two, four, six, seven books in total, and then I put these separately. These are my two books of short stories mm -hmm. and my love story that I wrote as well. So. Um, in total, I've written um, 10 books, 10 books oh. so far since 2013. Quite a lot. Yeah, not too bad, actually. I'm, I'm, I'm really pleased um, with how it's gone. I, I do have a new series um, that I've written three books for um, that I was due to um, publish at the end of this month. Oh. Sorry, at the end of last month, November. Yes. But then my mum was very poorly and sorting everything out. There's no way I could have done a whole yeah. book launch you know, um, and look after my mum and everything else was going on teaching as well at the uni. So um, I put that back till next spring. So the new series will be out next spring, the Rhonda George thrillers. Yeah. So tell us about teaching, because how you managed to have a home life, a work life and write? <laughs> well, easily, actually. I, I love it. Um, I, I actually work quite well under pressure. I actually really enjoy it. I really set myself hard tasks. Um, and I thought... <clears throat> When I started teaching um, three years ago at Canterbury Christchurch University, um, it's only about 20 minutes from where I live here in Whitstable. Mm. Um, so it's, it's ideal, really, um, for me just to, to pop in there. But obviously, it's all been done online um, yeah. this year. So that's been great in some ways. My, um, my second year students, I know because I met them last year. But my first year students, I feel sorry for because they had all the problem with all the sort of um, A-level results and all of that mess up. Yeah. And then they get to university for their first year and then find out that, um, you know, there's no sort of like freshers week and they don't yeah, meet half yeah. of the lectures face to face. So it's been really tough for them. But, um, you know, we, we, we get on great because I, I love a good chat. I love a good discussion. Um, and I really just try and, you know, get them all going um, because a lot of it is... Um, um, confidence, I think, for the young people. They don't, you know, they, they lack confidence with their writing skills. They're not sure what they want to do. And when I'm trying to teach them the non-fiction and commercial writing, it's like, well, oh, that's a bit scary. They just want to write sort of poems or a novel or something like that. And I say, no, the, the two of them, especially if you're a self-published author, go hand in hand. If you're blogging or explaining about your research, then, you know, it's it's good to have um, skills in, in all in all in all ways, really, writing skills across the board, really. Yeah. Valerie Keogh, um says hello. Hi, Valerie. Hello, Valerie. Hi. Hi. And I will, I did warn you that I would have to click onto my phone with um, our video because otherwise I can't see who's commenting. Paula Williams. Okay. Hi, Paula. She says good Hi. to be here. Hi. Hello. Hi. So I'm going to dive straight in. I don't know, like um, <laughs> <laughs> Um, the research that you do is quite yes. thorough and different. I don't yes. know many people who do courses. No, no. I've I've done a, a couple of courses online, um, free courses actually with Future Learn, which have been invaluable to me. Mm. I did one on um, art and antiquities and uh, trafficking, looting, um, art, stolen artifacts, which has been invaluable because a lot of my work, because it's based in Europe. Um, it helps me understand how how the legal side works, and then how you know my protagonist can break break the rules in some ways as well, and how I can get some really good baddies and some good plot points going. So they, that those sort of things were invaluable to me. Um, and I've done one on shipwrecks and submerged worlds because I want to eventually um, you know write about um, underwater um, artifacts as well. 
so yeah I, I love doing things like that but then I also I contact um very well-known people or people uh from my first book Golden Icon I contacted two opera singers because my protagonist was a, an opera singer so um uh I, I had to ask them because I knew nothing I don't I can't sing opera I can't sing at the best of times <laughs> so you know I talked I talked to experts as well and then in another um for Masterpiece book one um I was talking about adoption and I contacted ITV's um, Ariel Bruce, you know, the, she, the you know, long lost families. Oh, she did yeah. all the research. Yes, she's the, she's, the, um, she's the psychologist behind all that who helps the people in the background meet each other. Um, so I contacted her because I had some questions and she has been, she was incredible. You know, we had two or three phone calls and she was, she was just brilliant to help with, with all that, with, our, with all that process as well. So I do contact a lot of experts and get to the nitty gritty. Yeah, definitely. The countries that you've chosen um, yes. to set Nikki's books in, yeah. why did you choose those, like the three different places and have you visited them all and what research did you have to do? I mean, that's three questions really, I'll let you answer one of them. <laughs> I've told you for them all. <laughs> no. um, yes, um, they're, they are, they're all set in three different countries. Um, I, I lived in Spain for 20 mm. years, I lived in Malaga, I lived in the Costa Brava and then I lived in Pamplona. Um, which was a fantastic experience because it was the real Spain. Um, and so I got to know a lot about Spain and I, because, you know, I drive, used to travel all across Europe um, and 30 years in the travel and tourism industry has given me a, a good background for, for a lot of my scenes and locations in my book. Um, I, I've chosen them really, um, I've chosen three of them, three locations in each book because I think three sort of tends to work. Um, and I chose, I've tried to mix and match in a way. I've chosen sort of Morocco, I've chosen New York, I've chosen, you know, um, Tallinn, Warsaw, um, different places, Roxlaff in Poland, trying to do different places um, so that people, when they go on holiday, they think, oh, you know, I've been here or I've been there, I've been to Mallorca where she set, you know, Arta, where she set, you know, some of this book or, you know, some of the books are set in London, part, some scenes in London, um, even in Canterbury. Um, Salisbury as well, the New Forest. So I've tried to mix and match um, so that people will be able to identify, you know, where where, where I've been and where they have gone to um, and think, oh, yes, I remember that. Oh, yeah, I know that. And I remember that. And yeah. And obviously, it's a good excuse to travel. And, you know, I've got friends in a lot of places abroad as well. So in Dresden and Mallorca and places. So it's a good excuse to visit them as well. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever visited any places from a book that you've read? Have you ever thought, I really need to go and see this place? Um, yeah, I mean, not just books that I've read. Because I've worked in the travel and tourism industry, obviously, you know, every day you're sort of marketing and, you know, promoting places, um, things like that. So, you know, I would be always reading travel articles, especially travel blogs. And yes, there's, there's places I've, I've travelled a lot, but there's still lots of places I would like to visit. Mm. India is one of them. I'd love to go to India. I'd love to, I could set a trilogy in India easily and uh, as South America as well. Um, and speaking Spanish would, would be brilliant because, you know, I could get around a lot easier there and, you know, um, go off into the real, the real countryside, not into mm -hmm. the hills. And, oh yeah, I'd love to do that, go out to the Argentinian Pampas or something like that. It'd be fantastic. <laughs> so you're fluent in Spanish, obviously, after living there yeah. for so long. Any yeah. other languages? Um, well, no, I think, but I think when you have a basis in, in, say, Spanish, you understand quite a lot of Portuguese or Italian. And because I was in Europe, um, it, it was just that European culture, you know, you'd understand quite a lot of French and I have a lot of German friends. Um, so I think I feel very at home in Europe, I must say, um, because I travelled so much through through Europe anyway, exploring and going off the beaten track, which was which is also lovely. So. Um, no, it's, but just mainly Spanish. Yeah, I, I love the Spanish language. We've got questions coming in at the side. Um, okay. Vanya Keo wants to know what you're currently working on. Okay, um, that's that's interesting, Valerie. Um, thank you for asking. Yes. Um, well, I finished this the Mickey Dos Santos um, thriller series, and I've I've currently um, finished the next trilogy in a new in a new crime thriller series called um, the Rhonda George um, thriller series. And she's a very exciting protagonist. She's a kickboxing um, master chef. So she gets into all sorts of trouble and she's poised um, to be in great locations. I've set it in England and Wales and Scotland, the three books, mm. um, because she's then in a great place to overhear conversations, to meet sort of people that you wouldn't normally come into contact with. 
So um, they're all um, at the moment in the editing process. Two, two have been with the editor. Um, one's yet to go off to the editor. I'll finish that in January. Um, but more locally, um, we have a, a theatre here in Whitstable and during lockdown, um, they asked me if I would write um, a couple of, or well, to start with one um, monologue. So I wrote a monologue um, for my wife, who's um, an actor. So she performed it and they're actually going to put it on the internet on Friday um, on YouTube. So we're looking forward to seeing that. I've never actually seen my work acted out before. So, you know, that would be quite an interesting thing. But because they liked it so much, they've asked me to do three more. So it'd be, there'd be four of them in total, but with different different actors. And um, they also asked me if I had a radio play um, that they could um, produce because they can't act on stage. There is a, there's there's this presumably there's this um, uh, competition where you can um, where the different um, amateur uh, dramatic societies can um, submit a radio play, and I did have a radio play called Aqua Tofana about a murder in a theatre. So it worked out quite well. I sort of I published that up in the summer as well, and I've given it to them, and they absolutely love that. So yeah. people are auditioning for that now, and that will all take pay, place in um, next spring. So that's really exciting as well. I'm really looking forward to that. Something different. It must be. Is it yeah. um, unusual for Amanda to be performing things that you've written, or did she just absolutely love the idea? She well, um, she did love the idea. Um, it was her idea. She said, "Jan, would you write something?" Because they're talking, you know, they want to be able to down at the theatre. They want to be able to produce something to entertain people when the theatre can get back to normal. Yeah. Um, so it's going to be acted live on stage, and it's, it still probably will be next next year when the theatre's open. Um, but what they've decided to do in the meantime is to film it all. Um, so and they had part one uh, last night, and then part two is on Friday night, and they put it out to all the the Linley players members, and then they can um, enjoy it all now because it's it's difficult in lockdown. You know, there's no mm. pubs or bars, no theatre, no cinema. Yeah. You know, a lot of people think, what do you do every evening? They get a bit fed up with television and same old, same old. So, yeah, it's going well, I think. Yes, good. that's really good yeah. to hear. Oh. Yeah, I'm thrilled. I'm delighted. Valerie's asked, is there a part of the writing process that you dread? Um, that's interesting. Um, I think sometimes when you first start, after I finished the Mickey Dos Santos thriller series, I thought, oh, my goodness, what, what now? Um, how can I ever match anything as exciting as thrilling? Because they're all page turners, they're all roller coasters, they're all, oh, they're all sort of like... Oh, you're writing at the deep end. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <I> do <didn't> really. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I try to do that, and you know, I, I I want to sort of you know surprise people, shock people, and you know get get them get excited and get them page turning so that you know they think I'll oh, just read five page you know a, a page or two before one I go to chapter, bed, and then one more chapter, and then it's two in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. I have somebody. I had somebody message me the other day and said they were late for work because I got under the bed with a cup, with a cup of tea in my book and then they forgot to, to go to work. So it's lovely getting messages like that. It really is. Um, so yes, I, I sort of dread when when that process is over and it's been what I what I call success. I'm getting good reviews. I'm getting nice emails from readers all over the world, and I think you know, can I do it again? And it's that process where you're you come up with an idea and so you have the development arc for one book and then you think well, I'll do a trilogy to sort of um, and maybe it might maybe it might have legs to go further than that so um you put it all together but you still don't know until somebody else has read it so obviously the first person I read it past is, is Amanda because she's used yeah. to looking at scripts she's used to, to writing she was a teacher as well for 20 20 odd years so you know she she will understand where I'm coming from with my books and and she won't lie to me and I know that for a fact <laughs> you know she'll say look Jan this is you know this isn't working or this isn't great or you need to tighten this or sometimes she'll just plow through it and say oh my god I just couldn't put it down and I know that if she's like that and if I can entertain her then I'm on the right track and then obviously I've got some other beta readers and run the idea past a few other people and then once you've got that development the first draft done then I tighten it all up yeah. um but yeah there's I think there's always a part of you that's always a little bit nervous anyway, but it's that thrill anyway, isn't it? It's that thrill and that challenge that I enjoy. <laughs> yeah. So what kind of things do you say to your students when it comes to top tips or are there any, you know, pitfalls or things that you get asked by your students, you know, time mm. and again, every new mm. batch of students always have similar um, questions. 
Yeah, of course, that's normal. I mean, um, I, I teach um, first years and second years. I teach nonfiction and commercial writing, and then I teach um, professional practice. Mm. So it's mostly, you know, obviously nonfiction. But I do teach on the MA um, for anybody who wants to, you know, um, do crime thrillers. Um, so I think, to be honest with you, I think what's important across the whole spectrum for writing is structure. Mm. And I say to my students, if you if you can get your structure right, in whatever you're writing, whether it's a blog, a feature article, a short story, you know, a novel, whether it's a romantic novel or a sci-fi or a dystopian novel, whatever it is, if you can get your structure and your plot points there, and then you've got that guideline, you don't always have to stick to it, but you've got that guideline that will help you through to a, a, a really good satisfying conclusion. And then, you know, when you've done your first draft, then you go back and you start tightening it, tightening it all up. And I always think of it as like um, an onion and I just mm. put layers and layers on top. Mm. You know, once I know where I'm going and, I, and then I know how to fool or lead the reader on to mislead them so that I can put the twists and the turns in. Yeah, so as, a, as, a, as an author, you have to have that control. You have to be in control, yeah. I feel like I'm not going to be in control at all. I'll be coming back to you on this. Oh, um, no problem, anytime. <laughs> um, Kaz says hi to us both. And is Mickey based on anyone you know? No, um, no, she's she's not actually. Um, I, I, I think it's part of me would like to be somebody like her. I think she's sort of like this brave soul that, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm not the bravest person. Well, I'd like to think I am, um, but she's, she's incredibly um, flawed. She, she's had a, a bit of a rough um, upbringing. She's, she was brought up, um, she was born in Ireland, brought up in um, Spain by, um, she was adopted and the, the, her parents, the adopted parents didn't want her either. So she grew up with all that sort of like mm. um, rejection. And the only place that she could find um, refuge or safety or comfort from, from an alcoholic um, father and, a, and, a, and an abusive mother was to go into the churches. So she used to hide in the churches. And in Spain, I was always enthralled with the peace and quiet and the beauty of the churches. You can go to a church in the middle of nowhere and there's the most incredible engravings or drawings or, you know. Um, and even if you're not religious particularly, there's something about the aura, something about the stillness. Um, and, and this is what Mickey would find in there. She'd find that comfort and then she'd end up talking to either priests or people that knew stuff. And she became informed and started teaching herself and asking lots of questions because I think religion can do that. They can, you know, it can, it can stimulate your mind to ask lots of questions, you know, about philosophy and everything, moral, moral codes of behavior. And then, of course, she, she ended up on the, the wrong side of the track. She started taking drugs and, you know, she had a bit of a rough time. And then all of my books in the series um she's 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 in her 30s when we when in the first book and then she does have to go back to malaga and she does come across the some people in her past and have to come to terms with you know what happened in her past and face reality that way um so it is all laid out there um sometimes quite graphically but you know it's it's not such a difficult read that it's that it's that you're sort of going oh no you know it's 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 an, what i would say an acceptable read you know, um, it's not too X-rated, if you know what I mean. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah, it makes perfect sense. Yeah, because the, the books are entertaining. You don't want somebody to sort of be, be be sort of lulled into this sort of Dan Brown or James Bond sort of, you know, rhythm. And then you get this stark sort of like awfulness um, yeah. coming at you. You know, you, you, you do need the highs and the lows, but they have to be a good balance, a reasonable balance um, for the reader. Yeah, I'd absolutely agree. Yeah, there's nothing worse than it just being out of kilter. No, Very that's right. and that way you, you if and, and if the reader feels that you've misled them, then they be they, they feel betrayed mm. and that trust goes. And all the time, and I think I'm very conscious of this, you have to build up that trust with your reader. They have to know that when they pick up one of your books, is you're gonna push them to the edge, but you're not gonna push them over the edge. You're yeah. gonna push them to they're gonna think, oh my goodness, oh my god, oh my god, oh, oh. <laughs> and then the next you take them to the next the next step and they think, Oh no, 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 that this is this is impossible. How how is she ever gonna get out of this? And how is she gonna cope with that? But then she does, because you give her those resources, which are all there anyway, but you know, um, and the reader will accept that they were there because you you lay all the bread trails leading up to that. So mm. that's why you need to do so many rewrites and put the onion skin around the mm -hmm. round the novel. <laughs> um, 
On your travels, do you meet characters that scream to be written in a book? That's from Valerie as well. Um, so great. Valerie, thank you for your engagement. I'm loving this thing. You know, it's so much easier. And I say this to my students, if you ask me questions, it's fantastic because I can talk till the cows come home. I um, know. But, but it's good to know. It's what good we want. To be able to answer exactly what people want. Um, do any characters, I, I'd like to think that sometimes they do, mm. um, but then they don't because, you know, I've met some incredible characters, some very lifelike characters, but then I'd be frightened to write about them particularly because I think it's um, it's quite risky. So I think my characters might be sort of made up of different pieces of certain people yeah. become another character or there are just certain traits that I would pull out. I mean, unfortunately, I have met um, a few narcissists in my life and, and stolen script. is There is a narcissist in there and in Truthful Lies um, because because they obviously make really good um, sort of baddies, if you, for want of a better oh, yeah. word, you know, the uh, anti-heroes. And, um, you know, I, I, I can write quite well about narcissists because I have met a few, unfortunately, in my time. And unless you, unless you can understand their charm, unless you can understand how they can worm their way into, you know, certain people's lives and how they get away with it, then, you know, I think that, that, that certainly has helped me, although I'm not particularly proud of that. But, um, yes, in some of my other short stories, there were certainly some some incredible characters um, that would, would might have been based on people um, in, in that I, you know, might loosely have met, especially in my earlier book, Red Shoes, um, this is, this is I wrote these short stories, 17 of them, when I was doing my MA. Um, and some of them are based on true stories, like Conchita Sintron, she was the first Spanish bullfighter. Um, there was a, um, a, a plane that came down in Clonakilty in Ireland and, um, during the Second World War, um, which was a fabulously interesting story, a true story. And it came down in, in the fog um, and crash landed. And there were eight, eight, pie, eight, eight crew on board, uh, a crate of bananas and a monkey. Um, so it's things like that that would inspire me and that might that more more scenes and things like that that might inspire me to write to write a story to be honest with you rather than characters Ooh. in circumstances I think yes I don't think there's anything wrong with putting bits and pieces of different people into one person anyway we must all yeah. do that I think we do I think I think it's a natural thing to do because you know there might be a conversation or something that resonates with you or something that might have annoyed you or upset you or, or, or drawn that emotion out of yeah. you because it's emotion that that you know sells sells books isn't it um the the irony when I when I wrote Golden Icon which is the prequel to my series um I happened to be in Lake Como one of the places where it's set and I was um I'd moved to Ireland so I some of it was set in Dublin um but I actually by coincidence was introduced to an opera singer while I was there and I said to her my goodness one night at this party at this friend's party I said um my book is, is is about an opera singer and I said I don't really know a lot about opera and it was fantastic because uh, I met her um, the next day and we had a fantastic meeting and I and I did a lot of research and a lot of notes um, all about the, um, the opera world and because I, I would never have known how they breathe and how they train and their posture and and it's those little de details that you put into your book that bring the books alive yeah absolutely um, you know that's 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 what my readers tell me and that's how i feel when i'm reading a book as well i it's all those little details that you probably wouldn't have known um that either comes through research or talking to somebody um you know another one of the other opera singers i spoke um sang at um a, a friend's uncle's funeral in dublin and she sang in such a beautiful way she was up at the back at the back of the church it was just so hauntingly beautiful and I write about that in, in, in my book as well. I bring that in and I spoke to that opera singer as well when I was in Dublin. So it's things like that that, that, that I find interesting myself. Um, but you don't write sort of like masses and masses about it. It's just dropping, you know, the key bits in there that, that, will, that I find interesting, that I hope the readers will also find interesting. Yeah. Hmm. Um, Kaz wants to know what your wife thinks of your novels. What, oh, she loves them. Yeah, well, she touched on this Otherwise, it sounds really isn't it? I'll, I'll call out and ask her. <laughs> she, you know, she's, not she's, starting um, a domestic. Pardon? Not starting a domestic. <laughs> no, no, no. no I'm very, she's in, incredibly supportive. Oh. Incredibly supportive. You know, um, and um, yeah, I think I think she'd love them to be turned into a film, and I think she'd like a part in it as well. So, I mean, she'd love to do that. But I'm, I'm incredibly lucky um, that she, you know, she's, you know, 
she's brilliant so we're, we're blessed both of us to to be able to lead the lives that we both enjoy um and we have so much in common as well it's fantastic we're, we're blessed we're very lucky yeah which must have been helpful this year everybody everybody spent so much time at home so oh yeah it's been very difficult um although you know um amanda's been doing commercials from home you know online and things like that um sometimes she drags me in and says to me oh they need a same-sex couple will you come and you know do an advert um, and we were going up to Manchester, I think, a uh, crew for a commercial um, just before the second lockdown. And we, we'd organised the two cats in Jim Polo. We'd organised Teddy and they wanted us to stay overnight in the Premier Inn um, up in Crewe. And I'd never been so excited to stay in a Premier Inn in my life because it's the first time we'd been away all summer. And I said, oh, look, we can, we can have dinner in the hotel and we can you know, have a really nice evening on our own without any of the animals around us and everything. And we're going around the M25 and we get a call from the casting director. And um, she said, where are you? We said, we're just near, um, oh, I can't remember the services there. South Mim Services. Thank you. So, uh, so she said, oh, pull over, pull over, because um, Boris Johnson's about to make an announcement. So we pulled over. Um, so we'd driven about, I don't know, 300 miles, 150 miles, that's right. Um, so we, we, we had a cup of coffee and she said, I'll phone you. So she phoned us about half an hour later after we'd had the coffee. She said, no, it's all been cancelled. It was for um, an advert, quite a, a, quite a well-known large advert going on. I can't say who it is, obviously, but mm. she said, no, you have to turn around and go home. So we laughed all the way home, saying it's, a, it's the most uh, furthest we've ever travelled to go for a romantic coffee together on the Mim Service Station. It gave the girls in the car to whack the music up, sing along, and just, just life's what it is. And we, we just have to yeah. try and cope with it as much as we can. I think a lot of people are a lot worse off than we are. We're very fortunate. Yeah. It does sound like a romantic car ride for a coffee, though. It's a long way. <laughs> Yeah, we didn't even have dinner, didn't have anything. It was just, oh, we laughed. But you have to laugh about things like that. I mean, at least you got to go for a bit. Well, we did. You know, it's really nice. And it's sometimes, you know, you, 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 you live in the same, you know, environment as somebody. But, you know, it's only when you're actually shut in the car together, you end up sort of talking about all sorts of things that, you know, you, you, I don't know. We, we're lucky we, we talk about everything anyway. But, you know, it, it was just it was just great fun. And when we've run out of things to say, we just whack the music on and then we sing, so which is nice. Yeah, especially when I don't know the words half the time and I make them up. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I bet that's not annoying at all. My no, he says sing. I can't sing. That is that is a complaint, actually. <laughs> you remember that song, Brimful of Asher, years ago? It was like a one-hit wonder, I think. I hope I'm no, not No, no. Do you want to sing it? I mean, I didn't live here for 30 years, so, you know, I don't always have the background, yeah. of course. But it was a if you want to sing it, I'll do my best to join in. No, nobody <laughs> needs that. Nobody no, needs no. me singing. But part of the chorus was the word 45, and that was the only bit my dad would sing in the car, and it used to irritate me so much. And now I just think, no, it's like a really fond memory. So you're irritating me now, but Amanda will look back fondly on the car journeys and the, the crap thing, the not doing the words. And... <laughs> Um, oh, it's not having fun anyway, isn't it? My niece and nephew come around sometimes and they're like, oh no, no, because I start going, la 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 la. They go, no. So we just, it's just a case of messing around. Sometimes, you know, we, we take life a bit too seriously. And I think when when you are a writer, you, you're, 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 you know, whoever's listening will know as well that, you know, you spend a lot of time on your own and you can go a bit too loudly and you're just desperate <laughs> to, to hear the sound of your own voice because you've been, had so many other voices in your head and so many other things in your head. It's, it's just escapism, isn't it? Another form of escapism. <laughs> There's another brilliant question here from Valerie. If oh, you could on. invite four authors, living or dead, for dinner, who would it be? If I could invite four authors, living or dead, for dinner, oh, who would it be? Oh, okay. I think I would invite um I would invite Paul Coyo. Paul, you know, the, um he wrote The Alchemist, Paulo Coyo. Um, I would invite, um, I would invite, who? For <laughs> authors. Um, I would invite um, Dan Brown. I would invite Isabella Lende. Okay. And um, I would probably have said Jane Austen years ago, but I wouldn't probably now. I think it would be some have to be somebody like Shakespeare or somebody like that who, 
you know, he's probably the master storyteller, isn't he? Really, his 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 plays and everything, tran you know, transcends all of time, doesn't it? Really, so probably Shakespeare, I think. Um, but then four is never enough, is it? You don't, I, I, you know, there's loads more. Yeah. But I think those four off the top of my head at the moment. Ask me tomorrow and I'll come up with another four, I'm sure. Because yeah. I'll have had yeah, to them last night. So I'll be on to the next four. <laughs> I'm going to go to one of my absolute favourite questions that I love to ask. Oh, it's my God. One goodness. of our questions now that we always ask. Um, your most memorable moments as an author so far? My most memorable? Um, um, that's get so many answers with this one. Um, that's interesting. Um, I actually did. I actually did a book launch for Masterpiece. Um, that's book one. Um, I did the book launch in the bookshop in Christchurch, Canterbury, and it was the first book launch I'd, I've ever done. And you know when you sort of sort of think, oh, don't. And it, it was one of the other um, lecturers who said to me, "I think you ought to do one. I think you ought to do one." I know oh. because although I had my own marketing company for ten years in Ireland. Um, I can market everybody else, but I find it very hard to market myself. It's it's you know it's it's very hard to promote yourself. Yeah. Um, so um, they they said, oh, speak to Craig in the bookshop, and so I spoke to Craig in the bookshop. And he was lovely, and um, he said, yes, 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 we'll get wine in, and we'll get all this, mm -hmm. and we'll do. It. I said, really? I think me, you know, oh, okay. And um, I don't know. I think there must have been about seventy or eighty people there. Um, which when I when I didn't know anybody, I was sort of shocked, and I sold an um, incredible amount of books, incredible amount of books, mm -hmm. and I was obviously doing the book signing, and I obviously had a lovely few glasses of wine as well, which was very nice. But I think the the most nicest thing was this man came up to me, and um, he said to me, "I saw your poster in the window. They were they were announcing that you were doing the book signing here." He said, "And I had all of your books anyway." And he said, oh. I couldn't believe that you lived near here. And he said that you were actually coming here. He said, so I bought all the other books I've got. Will you sign them all for me? And I said, how did you, you know, you, you, you do work on campus. He said, yeah, I'm one of the caretakers. He said, but I just love all your books. And I think, he didn't know that he no, was, no, no, no. He didn't know that I was a lecturer there. He didn't know that I was, well, I'd only just been there a year. It's about three, three, three or four years ago. But it was just such a lovely thing. And that, that for me, you know, was very special. And then I've been asked to speak at book clubs, which is obviously also a pleasure, um, especially if they're in somebody else's um, house, you know, and they have very informal and it's involving, you know, Prosecco or something. It's very, very enjoyable. But you get to speak about books and you get to speak to like-minded people, people who are interested in, in what you do. And, oh, I, that, that, that is very special for me. Really, really special. I love that. What other authors have you met since, or oh, from before you becoming an author yourself um mm. have you got people that you speak to because as you said it can be quite lonely it can be quite lonely i i i'm um friends with an awful lot of authors um obviously through facebook that i met through facebook i met some of them um at the london book fair um about i went up about three years ago and i met um mark dawson of course he's one of the biggest ones um joanna penn um uh, A.A. Abbott, who's Helen, um, who's lovely. Um, I don't know if you're interviewing Helen on the 16th of December, I think. Oh, is. Helen's lovely. We met at the London Book Fair. Exactly. She's lovely. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, she's, she's brilliant. She's, she's, her series are brilliant, yeah. Um, Tim Heath, he lives in Tallinn. Um, we got talking because obviously I've been to Tallinn and I was selling one of my books in Tallinn. And then when I'd written that section on the, those scenes on Tallinn, and I sent them to him and I said, has anything in Tallinn changed since I was there? Because I had been there a few years before. Mm -hmm. And um, he was brilliant. So he was very good. Um, so loosely, yes, I'm in touch um, with, with a lot of other authors. Um, you know, we do news, I just swapped um, Sandra Davenport, um, um, or Celia. Um, can't remember Ocelia's surname now, but yeah, you know, all the time we do newsletter swaps, and you know, if somebody's got a book launch or book promotion coming out, you know, we put it with our um, subscriber list because obviously we're all building our own subscriber lists, um, so that's great. We, we we update them regularly with with our with our new books coming out or for other people's books coming out in a similar genre. Yeah, so that will be crime thriller authors as well, mostly. Yeah. But that's great because you can say to them, you know, when you did your book launch, what worked for you? Did you try this? Did you try that? And and it's fantastic to have that that help and support. It really is, yeah. I love it. Um, the Mickey Santos books, Mickey Dos Santos books. Yes. They are 
even though you've got obviously Mickey running through them all, there are they more standalones? You can read them in any order. Yes. Yes, you can read them in any order. They all they're all completely standalones. They're all they all involve a, a specific piece of artwork. I mean, Golden Icon, for example, it, it you know involves a, a stolen golden icon that was part of the Nazi horde, um, and she's um, the the protagonist, the protagonist um, Josephine Lavelle, the opera singer, is emotionally blackmailed by her um, ex-husband to go to collect this golden icon. Um, but unfortunately something happens to him and she's left, you know, with this precious icon wondering what to do with it next, because all she really wants to do is to fight her way back onto the stage just for one last chance to sing uh, Tosca. So, you know, that's all, that all sort of revolves around um, a stolen icon. Uh, masterpiece here involves um, Vermeer's The Concert. And quite sometimes I get my ideas from articles that I read, you know, and I've read about, um, you know, the Isabella Stewart Museum in 1990 um, had a big heist on St. Patrick's Day. Two men knocked at the door and the whole the whole city in Boston in, in America is celebrating St. Patrick's Day as they do. And two men knocked at the door, tied up the security guard and stole 13 pieces of artwork to order. Um, and, they, and it was worth something like $500 million. Uh, but they stole them to order. So they left other more expensive pieces behind. But one of the paintings they stole was Vermeer's The Concert. Um, which I found really interesting. It's the most stolen painting in the world, most yeah. valuable stolen painting. That still hasn't been found. It still hasn't been found. So in this book, Mickey finds it. This is the first book introducing Mickey as, a, as an art forger, an artist and photographer. Mm. She finds it and she's about to steal it. She's about to paint a forgery and steal it. But then her past catches up with her and um, she then has to choose between what she's always wanted and or becoming um, a thief and an art art thief and um, beginning a career in the underworld in yeah as a criminal and she ends up fighting for her life and um, yeah that ends up in New York in a, in a fantastic scene at the end there so yeah all of the books you know have that pace pace um, attached to them yeah do we tell you about the other books yeah 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 okay well book of hours um, Mickey then goes on to um, go back to Malaga, where she originally had spent a lot of time. Um, her, a dear friend of hers who runs a museum in Malaga um, wants her to authenticate uh, a book of hours, which is a which is an illuminated manuscript, a medieval illuminated manuscript. Um, so she's sort of emotionally cajoled into going back there, but then she has ends up um, fighting for her life after her friend um, gets into serious trouble and she takes the book of hours she comes to canterbury in england to get the um to try and get the parchment authenticated um sorry the book of the illuminated manuscript authenticated and then it's it's stolen from her so then she has to steal it back so from the baddies so you know in doing this she she sort of like has to find herself and she has to decide on what side of the fence she wants to sit if she's on the side of the good people or the bad people i think your screen's frozen so I, Sam, I don't know if you can still hear me. Yeah, I'll I'll keep talking just in case you've you, your screen is frozen. Um, in stolen script, okay, this is the third book, and actually at the moment I've put all three of these books. I've reduced the price of these three books um, down to seven ninety nine in paperback, as I'm doing a special offer this this week on all of my books. Um, but stolen script is set in New York, um, Turkey, and Greece, and it's about um, a Jewish Torah that um, has to be returned to the Jewish Museum on the island of Rhodes um, in Greece. So this is an exciting roller coaster. This is where one of my um, very um, well-known um, pr protagonists um, come into place, or the anti-hero, I should say, who's the big narcissist. Um, and he charms Mickey in the beginning. So, um, so OK, so, so long as you can all hear, I'll keep talking. I can see um, she's trying to come back, so I'll just keep talking. I'll try and keep you all amused, um, and I'll keep going here. Faking Game, I'll tell you briefly, um, is about famous sculptures, and a friend of mine here is a very good artist, and she helped me with with regard to talking about sculptures. And in this one, um, Mickey's newfound circle of friends, who there's a group that come in all of the books that we, we, we get to know and to like. Um, uh, she, one of... Her sculptures, famous sculptures, are stolen. So Mickey goes in search across Europe um, to try and get it back. 
and she goes across to Poland and Tallinn. And on the way, she meets a guy called Peter, who's an ex-SAS soldier who helps her and they team up, um, which is quite nice because um, he's not necessarily a romantic um, hero. There are other romantic heroes in the book, but he's a really good friend that she can banter with and feels comfortable with. So I'm thrilled with that one. Um, very briefly, until Sam gets back, Truthful Lies. Um, this book is set, um, Truthful Lies is, is set in Salisbury. You can see the cloisters yeah, of Salisbury Cathedral there. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's based around um, the ruby pear, which is a very expensive necklace. And it's about a, a wealthy family who are fighting for the family jewels and um, the lies that they would tell and the extent they'll go to for revenge. Um, so it's, yes, again, there's another narcissist in there, but then Mickey does meet her actual love interest and um, they end up in Sardinia and Croatia. Um, so hang on, I've just got a message from Sam. Okay, sorry, she's disappeared. Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll keep going and I'll talk some more, okay? And I did get your message, Sam, and this is the final book here, Broken Windows. And this is the final book in the series, and it starts with Mickey um, on the 30th floor, leaping off the top of the building. And um, you don't know if she's going to live or die. But um, I do like happy endings, but you'll have to work out how she does get out of that. If you read the opening chapter, even if you go and read the Look Inside pages on Amazon, um, it will give you an idea of the sort of... Um, emotional roller coasters that I like to bring my um, readers on. So yes, um, all of my books are available. If you if you want to go to my website, um, www.janetpywell.com, you can subscribe to my mailing list and um, Golden Icon is free to download. And that will give you access then to all of my um, other books and all of the information um, about my work. Um, she's trying to come back. You can hear me. Um, hold on. Caroline says, would you make a graphic novel of one of your books? Do you know what? That's a, that's, that's a really good idea. Um, I would love to, actually. I think that'd be really fantastic. I don't know how I would ever do that, but I think graphic novels, you know, with my students, they're certainly into computer games, graphic novels, um, and I talk to them all the time about those sort of things. Part of me feels as if I'm a bit too old to understand a lot about it, but I think it might be if I have time next year to look into how graphic novels um, can, how graphic novels can um, enhance your work and how they can sell. I don't really know enough about it, but I think I might um, look that up, definitely. Yeah, definitely look that up. I'm just going to see if Sam's coming back. Um, questions, resources, resources. Um, Okay, what do I recommend for writers? Resources for writers. Um, if you are, if you are interested in writing yourselves, if you know, and I and I think there's a lot of people on this on this um, UK um, crime um, book club who are interested in writing. Um, I would I would I read a lot of blogs um, about different things. Um, you know, anything that interests me for my research. For example, in some of my books, I've, I've used drones or gyrocopters, which are like small helicopters, but just seat one person, perhaps two, they're very small. Um, I've used um, all of those sort of resources. I'd, 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 certainly, I'd certainly read people's blogs, certainly use the internet. Um, and I contact a lot of people. Um, I'm, not, I'm, not, um, I'm not adverse to sort of contacting people and sort of saying, I don't know anything about kite surfing. In book one, Mickey um, is in a beach in Tarifa in the south of Spain, where which is where I used to go um, enormously. And um, I got a kite surfer from here who I met, uh, who we talked about winds, and she had a house in Italy. Um, she was going over there. She said, I'll reenact the scene that you're, you're creating for Mickey and I'll video it. So she did that to see if it was plausible what I actually wanted Mickey to do. Um, so that, that those sort of resources. Um, what resources would I recommend for other authors? If you're re if you're thinking about books, um, I would recommend um, Stephen King's um, I'm, "I'm Writing" on writing, and this um, "Writers and Artists Yearbook" 
I think that's invaluable. Um, there's a, um, it, it depends if you're thinking of self-publishing or if you're thinking of going down the traditional route of publishing or, or if you don't know what to do. And I think the Writers and Artists Year book um, is a very good indicator um, to point you in the right direction for, for both things. Um, it, will, it will give you all the agents and all the publishers where you can send your manuscript to. If you've written a manuscript, you know, invariably you send off the first um, three chapters, um, a synopsis and a cover letter. Um, you can Google those if you if you don't want to take the book out of the library or um, or anything like that. Um, and then there's also a website called the Alliance of Independent Authors, Ali A L L I. They're very good and they they they're very supportive of um, independent authors. So that's a really good one. Um, Mark Dawson, Joanna Penn, and Nick Stevenson are three very prolific self-published authors who do run marketing courses for self-published authors as well so you'll be able to to google them um and find their websites that you know they do a lot of free courses and paid courses brian cohen does um courses on sort of like amazon ads things like that as do many many other people so if you are thinking of um investing in one of these um authors um make sure you get a, a good one make sure you get somebody who's who knows what they're talking about um, and has the authority to speak to you and direct you properly. Don't just take any Mickey Mouse author or anybody who's just emailed you out of the blue. Make sure you've got somebody reputable who, who's got in the bestseller list themselves. Um, oh, um, Caroline is saying, uh, Sam's PC has had a major error. Oh, that's a shame. Um, so am I okay reading questions from the stream? Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to, to read questions from the stream if that's what you um, want to uh, do. Yep. Oh, somebody here, Facebook user said, oh, yes, Stephen King on writing is brilliant. Yes, um, I recommend it to all my students. And I know a lot of um, self-published authors have read that book as well. Um, which route into, into publishing did I take? Um, uh, Caroline, I, I took the self-publishing route. I did, when I wrote my first book, Golden Icon, um, I had just finished my MA at Queen's University in Belfast and I and I did the first uh, couple of chapters as my dissertation. And then I finished the novel, polished it all up, and I sent the first three chapters off to a lot of agents and publishers. And I was lucky, I had a lot of very positive feedback. Um, and they said they, they, they liked the book, but they wouldn't know where to publish it, what, where, what, what genre it sort of really fitted in. They couldn't see a market for it. And I was pretty disappointed because it was the sort of market of the sort of book that I would like to read myself. So I thought, well, do you know what? I'll do it myself. Um, so I did. I, I, I self-taught myself um, through Mark Dawson courses and Nick Stevenson and with the help of Joanna Penn. Um, I started self-publishing. And I obviously have published this six book series now. But the most important thing if you are self-publishing is to build up a network um, of, um, of readers, really. So you build a group of beta readers, of fan readers, so that you can run ideas past them. And then, you know, the, I suppose the principle of that is if you've got 20,000 readers on your database, when you bring out a book, if you're making a pound or two a book and each of your, you know, subscribers buy a, buy a book, then... You're going to make quite a decent income out of that. So everybody is, you know, tries to build, um, you know, their own um, subscriber list. And to do that, you offer a free book and you, you communicate with them, you talk to them and, you know, you they become your friends. I have a lot of friends and I get a lot of messages from all over, um, all over the world in America, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, especially. So. So, yes. Um, um, yeah, I'm self-published author and I, and I actually like that. Just as a matter of interest, I, I do know a lot of authors, especially in Whitstable, there's there's a, an awful lot of authors. And I know um, some authors have been offered a two book deal and they, they've been thrilled, excited by traditional publishers. And if the first book doesn't take off, um, sometimes their contract gets cancelled or their book, second book doesn't get published. Um, and it, it, it can be quite um, awful, an awful experience for some people that I've heard about, too. So think very carefully which which route you want to go down but self-publishing is tough because you have to be the writer the editor the book designer although you, you you get other people to do these things you have to oversee all that work and then you have to do the marketing and the advertising as well so 
it's not for the faint hearted. Um, but there's a lot of help out there, a lot of help, especially from people like me, from AA Abbott, other self published authors, we're always willing to help other people. Um, I've been asked, would I write in other genres? Yes, I, I, well, I've written two books of short stories. Um, some are romantic stories, some are, they, they all, I always like to write with a bit of a twist in them anyway. Um, uh, but this this bedtime reads is about the the people um, the lengths uh, of which people will go to in to pursue happiness or or revenge. Um, so I write to entertain really. I write because my 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 head works quite quickly, and I I, I get bored very easily. So I want something. I want a page turn. I want something that's going to you know in, you know make me feel um, excited and thrilled and keep a fast pace. Um, so yes, even my short stories are like that. And then I did tie my hand at Ellie Bravo, uh, my a romance, um, and um, I actually did a very unusual experiment with this. I did it while I was doing my MA, and I wrote it each week as a blog post. And I thought if I wrote 10,000 words each week, by the end of the year, I'll have 52,000 words, and that really is the basis for a novella. So um, I after I'd finished the overriding after I'd finished all the blog posts after the year, I then tidied it all up, edited it and put it into this book here. And you'll see it was all done in Belfast. That's Harland and Wolf uh, Cranes there. And that's Ellie Bravo on her motorbike. So that's a bit of a romantic um, experiment. Um, I suppose I'd actually like to write a rom-com actually. I've, I've got one as a first draft, but I'm not quite sure where to go with that. I'd like to write comedy, but I don't think I'm funny enough, but uh, I'll keep going with it. Um, Caroline says, have you cast the Mickey series in your head? Ah, I pictured her as a very distinctive looking character. Yes, yes, she would be quite striking. Um, I, I, I have and I haven't. Um, I don't know. No, I, I, I don't really know. But yes, yeah, she's, she's a, her, her, the thing with Mickey, I know that obviously it's, it would, it's not in real life, but her, 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 her body is a canvas of, um, masterpieces that she's covered in tattoos you know um she has um saint john the baptist severed head across her body across her chest and there's there's salome's seven bells around wrapped around her waist and she's got um the garden of eden she has edward when she's the scream up, up the inside of her arm it's like the anguish and the horror that she's been through to remind her of that so i think um yeah i think mickey's would would there's a hardness about her, but there's a, a, this incredible softness about her and this vulnerability inside her um, that you have to get to know and understand. And I think although the books are standalone novels, when you see the development and how she is and, and what she goes through, even through in each of the novels, and how she develops and grows as a person, um, at, to the ending of whatever you think of the ending, I'd be interested to know if you, if you think I've ended the series in the right way because you, you never know. Um, but I think the readers just generally do like it. Um, so yeah, it, it's, it's a very hard thing to do. So yeah, I, I think she is very distinctive. But as a character, I, I can't think who who could play her at the moment. No, I don't. Um, what real life event would you like to attend when we reach what my hubby affectionately calls the after times um the after times that's interesting when you say the after times i'm not sure what you mean by that um what real life would i like to attend the after times do you mean a real life event like um the oscars or something like that i mean i mean if you do well yes i'd obviously love to um, walk up the red carpet with 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 you know for the oscars for for not that i'd write the screenplay necessarily but you know to see um one of my books like that would be absolutely brilliant um, to be made into a film. Um, I don't think I'll ever get the, the prize for literature because my books aren't literary. They're, 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 they're well written, but they're not what you'd call a literary study. My books are, you know, crime thrillers, they're page turners, they're exciting thrills and spills and roller coaster rides. Um, so yes, I, I, I'd, 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 I think I'd go to the opening of an envelope quite honestly, if there was a good crowd there and nice people to talk to, that'd be, that'd be brilliant. Um, and Caroline says, do you sell signed copies of your novels? I do. I do sell signed copies of my books. Yes, I do. Um, you know, um, if, if people ask and I, I also give away signed copies 
um, when, I, when I get a, a book launch as well, um, or I offer competitions or something like that. Um, sorry, you said a real life bookish event. Yes. Um, I, well, I love the London Book Fair. Um, I haven't been to any. I was going to go to um, the Hay Festival, um, but obviously with, with COVID and everything happening, then that didn't happen. Um, but I've only lived in England for seven years. Um, you know, I've, I've lived abroad. I left in England when I was 21. Uh, and I've only been back um, seven years, so I haven't really got into um, all the different festivals. I know there's another one in Harrogate, crime crime uh, festival up there that I'd love to attend. So yes, I mean, I would go to um, any of the, the book fairs, I'd go to anything like that. The Frankfurt um, Book Festival, I believe is very good as well. So anywhere that I could talk to other authors, mix with other like-minded people, yeah, uh, I'll be there. I'd love to do that, really would. Yeah, definitely. Um, so I hope that, I hope you found this informative today. Um, all of you, thank you very much for joining me. Um, I'm sorry, Sam, um, that you, you've disappeared. I miss you. Um, it was funny because when Sam spoke to me at the beginning of the week, and we did that sort of short, um, intro to, to put on the Facebook page. She was just, she was just, um, great fun. And um, we, I think we laughed for about two minutes. She was just absolutely good fun. So um, I'm just going to um, briefly go over my novels in case you missed the beginning. OK, I'm going to tell you this is the Golden Icon. This is book. This is the prequel to the series. And all of my books are available on Amazon, Amazon.com. Um, if you want to go to my website, uh, JanetPywell.com, um, then you can subscribe to my mailing list as well. And you'll get a free copy to download of Golden Icon. All right. Masterpiece, um, that's Broken Windows. I've gone in reverse order. Here we are. Masterpiece is book one, okay? And book one, Masterpiece, um, book two, um, Book of Hours. There we are. And book three, Stolen Script, have all been reduced. I reduced them this week down from $9.99 to $7.99, okay? Because I think they make pretty good Christmas gifts, okay? Books one, two, and three, um, just to get people hooked into the series, okay? And then the third book, Sorry, the fourth book in the series is Faking Game and the fifth, fifth book, Truthful Lies. And then finally, Broken Windows. You can see that's set in London. That's the Tower of London there. And it's an incredible story. It's all about um, some parkour kids um, set in London and Morocco. And it's all about the underworld, the dog gangs, um, but done in a really interesting um, sort of way. So, um, this is the conclusion. I think you'll find the conclusion a massive surprise. I think when you read the opening and you'll read about Mickey facing, you know, 30 floors up and she's falling and um, you just don't know how she's going to get out of that. I didn't know how she was going to get out of it, but I ran it past my wife and she liked the idea. So I went with it and it has worked. And I'm lucky that my readers have written to me and they have thoroughly enjoyed it. So I hope you do too. Um, so I'm sorry, Sam, I'm sure you feel very frustrated um, not being able to stay with me. I, um, but we'll chat again another time. But I'd like to thank you very, very much um, for um, joining me um, and Sam today. And um, it's been a pleasure to talk to all of you. Um, please remember my name is Janet Pywell. Um, you can subscribe to my mailing list and you can find me on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram. And it's been really lovely to talk to all of you. And um, hopefully we'll be able to, um, I'll be able to sign us out of here somehow. And um, thank you so, so much for joining us. And a, and a big round of applause to Caroline for guiding me in the chat room here. Thank you, Caroline. And to Sam, um, meeting you has been fantastic. And if ever I can help any of you, please do reach out and contact me, um, you know, through Facebook or on my website send me an email. I always love to hear from any of you. And if I can help you, um, any of you and give you some advice, and I certainly will It'll be my pleasure to help any of you. Okay, so you have to bear with me while I try and turn this off. Not sure what I have to turn off or where, but I'll find it somewhere. But nice talking to you all and been fab to see you. Thank you so much, all of you. Thank you. Mm -mm -mm.